Hello, welcome back everyone. Um, this is episode 23 from an ongoing podcast we have on reigniting the fragments of the fourth way, where Peter Ingle and myself, Mihai Aljiu, are going into depth on some of the core teachings of the fourth way, the Gurdjieff Wuspensky system. At the same time, keeping as a background the teachings of non duality, direct path, Advaita Vedanta. And if you see this, you come to this video now, just know that this is episode 23 and below there is a, a playlist where you can access all the previous ones. And also know that we are doing this not just as a philosophical wise acreing, but we are doing this um, in order to support the practical application of these ideas. And we are engaged in ongoing regular weekly group meetings and you can see here below information about that <clears throat> and now we are doing it in person this is actually all the other um <laughs> all the other videos that we are like on zoom um different locations so it's nice to have you it is nice to, to do it in person yes yeah <laughs> So the idea we wanted to touch upon today is a very important idea in the fourth way for the purposes of um, diminishing the resistances and the denying forces to awakening. And, um, and um, this idea of false personality. In the fourth way, this is an important idea, part of practical work, along with uh observing these uh, obstacles towards self-consciousness in oneself and struggling with daydreaming identification expression of negative emotions inner considering lying um mechanical goodness all of these different types of uh what is called obstacles uh which are manifestations of being in the second state being in a state of self-forgetfulness and believing, thinking, sensing as being a separate, autonomous, independent entity as a me, as the body or the mind, checked out in thought, reactive, tormented, yeah? So uh, these obstacles I mentioned, they are in the way of, they are in the way of self-remembering self-consciousness at the same time they are the way we move through in order to develop this uh, higher states of being self-realization and so on of equal importance like the six obstacles is this idea of false personality false personality and that's the focus of our topic today to uh, explain share so that we have a more clear precise understanding what this false personality is how was it formed um what are some of its characteristics features behaviors type of thinking feeling in which way it uh which way is it detrimental to awakening and detrimental to happiness basically to even human happiness um, also we are going to link it or um, explore how it correlates with concepts like ego ego um, the imaginary picture of oneself the separate self the mind made sense of self as well as what we call the non-duality, the sense of me. Because ultimately they are very, it's one and the same, or they are different dimensions of the same type of, let's say, energy field or psychologically energy field or confusion, illusory, psychological, energetic sense of identity. Also, we are going to touch upon... Um, Okay, well, how can we free ourselves from it? How can we uh, eradicate it? How can we kill it, starve it? 
um, and also uh, perhaps not in this episode, but this may last two episodes, we'll see. Uh, there's also this idea of chief feature. Chief feature, a very important practical idea in the fourth way is that everybody has a certain core mechanical tendency around which the false sense of self, false personality revolves around. It's like a core pillar of this uh, construction of the imaginary identity and uh, some type of pattern, some kind of psychological tendency to deal with other people, with oneself, with the world. It's called chief feature, chief mechanicality, chief tendency when in sleep, we are tend to operate from that as a way of being. And when we are in that, we are most asleep and furthest from the shores of awakening where we try to go shores of the third state self-consciousness. Um, and this chief feature is like a core aspect of uh, false personality. So that's what we are trying to cover today. Um, in order to support practical work and uh, yes. So maybe we can uh, we can share a little bit about this in the system, um, what they speak about somehow false personality is always connected right away versus essence. We can give a little bit of context around that and mm -hmm. how false personality has been formed uh, and when. And yeah, let's start the ball rolling. I think a, one way to start is <clears throat> with the, the knowledge that when we are born, we're not born with a false personality. We're born just a simple nature, what the fourth way calls essence. And this false personality becomes, as the words, two words suggest, personality, persona, a mask. But instead of this mask representing our deeper true nature as we are born, uh, it becomes an artificial mask, a fake mask. And this mask then, instead of being a representation of, of what we are, who we are and what we are internally, just in our simple being, now this mask takes on a life of its own. And we now attach our sense of ourselves to the mask. And it's, how, it's what we show to the world. And it's how we project ourselves primarily to other people. It's very interesting, for example, to watch a person with just a dog or a cat hmm. and no other people. They're, they're not in their false personality. Their mask is off. It's down. This hmm. mask, which has become a protective, psychological protection, protective device, a guard, and a false projection, we don't need it. Uh, we don't with, but when we, as soon as we're around other people, we, the mask comes on automatically. And it has variations. It shifts takes on a different hue, slightly different behavior when we're with our mate, when we're with our best friend, when we're with a stranger, when we're with our boss or our coworkers, when we meet new people. Uh, in different situations, we the mask adjusts itself slightly because we're adjusting our feeling of identity. And at our core, we remain the same, but we adjust this personality, this artificial projection of ourselves to meet the circumstances in a way that will allow us to hold firmly to this artificial sense of ourself that we've developed. And this is what in other teachings is called the ego. But the fourth way breaks it down a little more, well, in a, in a different way and very specifically to show it's not just, it is one thing, but it's also always changing, has slight fluctuations, variations. And this is why in the East they say the illusion is tricky. And it, it's elusive. And this is, they're talking about this false personality, uh, how it will present itself in different ways at different times. And so we'll be getting into that uh, and giving examples of how this manifests, because inside we have this false sense of I. And the fourth way also calls this the imaginary picture of myself. You can call it the ego, imaginary picture of myself, false personality. And it's hard to see it internally at first. And so the way we begin to see it is to look at how it manifests outwardly. How do we act? 
What are the ways in which this gets projected to other people and to the world? We study that, and by virtue of studying that, we trace it back. It's like tracing back the, um, the Wizard of Oz and finding our way all the way to his home and going inside and pulling the curtain back and seeing the ego back behind the curtain there operating this show which is, and that's what false personality is, it's a show, it's a demonstration of identity. But it's false in the sense that it's not, it's not who we are at our core being. And it's not even a, an authentic representation of who we are at our core being. So obviously self-observation, self-knowledge in the context of awakening or enlightenment, this is, a, this is the foundation essentially for understanding who we are not and what the implications of this are. Yeah, I'd like to back it out a little bit. Uh, I mean, back it, back it, um, go back to the origin a little bit and define some more terms. Because also I, I work with people and uh, we use the word ego and, and I just talked to someone the other day and explain about ego and they said no no I, I don't have a I don't have an ego like that I don't have an ego and then I realized that there's this misunderstanding um sometimes ego is understood as being uh, arrogant or feeling superior having an inflated uh uh self-importance look at me you know like a big shot or like a big shot politician something like that um and he was saying, no, I don't, I don't have that. But just to define terms, to be precise, um, even ego, uh, even the way Eckhart Tolle uses or other teachings, um, uh, non-duality, ego, separate self, and even false personality, I would say that they are, it can take different shapes. It can be inflated, superior, self-importance, arrogant, taking space, obnoxious, look at me, vain, uh, controlling, uh, unempathetical, uh, bullying, you know, can be like that. But it can equally be uh, falsely meek, uh, going against oneself, uh, not having boundaries in order to get approval, um, trying to be nice uh, when underneath one feels something else, self-pity, self-deprecation i'm not good enough there's something wrong with me i'm a failure uh look at me you know so all of this it's from the point of view of these teachings they are it's equally the same equally the same fabric is the same, different side of the same coin and um the characteristic or to see behind this either inflated or deflated energy is that the the belief there are thoughts, the feeling and the sensation and energy of being an autonomous, separate, independent me. Yeah, so that what that's what we mean by ego. And everybody, unless have done a lot of specialized, arduous work, that's that is, yeah, of course, I'm separate, independent, autonomous me. Um, so that's what we mean by ego and false personality. Um, usually we, we I mean usually we are always born with uh, they call in the fourth way essence so there's this a spirit or a being that which perceives uh, as you see babies you know there's there's no false personality there's no baggage there's no memory it's just being aware you know that's that's the, the the most fundamental essential aspect of our identity but then in the fourth way, there is that there is also some kind of peculiarity, unique peculiarities connected to body type, to genes, to center of gravity, to certain psychological and uh, tendencies, uh, uh, as well as talents, you know. So, uh, and you can see with children, uh, although they are still very much in essence, um, they are different from each other. Uh, even the young children, uh, some are more uh active or exploratory some are more quiet and observant 
some are right away very attracted to building things. Some are more attracted to music. Um, some are more attracted to just nature. So there are different tendencies which are inbuilt, some uniqueness of the expression of this universal being energy. So this is, uh, and which is like a diversity, you know, the, the diversity um, on the planet. And, but what happens is that um, as soon as we are born, but especially as we start to learn words and language and interact with adults, and adults usually are, I would say, high percentage in false personality and asleep. Um, so for the process of uh, education, for the process of being taught how the world operates, concepts, how to be, uh, for the process of simple osmosis or, or imitation, uh, we are looking at our parents or at society uh, who are actually in false personality and we are becoming it. Mm -hmm. um, so the false personality is formed for education, for imitation, or, or for trying to not be like our parents. It's kind of equally, it forms another kind of reactive kind of sense of uh, persona, mask, identity, as well as through our life experiences, you know, dealing with adversity um, or dealing with a, some kind of unloving environment or an unsafe environment, we develop some way to get love and get approval and be safe, becoming a slightly different way, becoming kind of strategic, for instance, becoming more um, very charming <laughs> because I found that if I'm charming and funny, then it's more peaceful at home or uh, working hard uh, to get straight A's and to be perfect, the feeling I need to be perfect because then maybe I will get love or or developing this hiding deception um, in order to be safe. So all of these are tendencies that are developing in a child when is so the false personality starts pouring in, starts the programs, the conditioning starts developing and gradually, you know, by the time we are teenager also there's this crisis of identity and we basically we are a little bit um not having been raised in a tribe or in people who are in their essence now the the child is really confused the teenager is confused lost there's all of instagram facebook all of this what you are learn how to be and what's right the teenager is uh, removed from his essence is confused and is trying to be something, trying to be, you know. And then, so this develops all of this uh, imitation, wounding, adaptation, trying to be something else, trying to be liked, all of that form this sense of me, which becomes the uh, adult uh, personality or ego with which we identify and with which we even come to meet this work you know we we are this part this part that is feeling uh, on the outside it may feel some people may feel very good about themselves and feeling that i got this and other people may feel very uh, deficient and deflated um but either way this this aspect we believe this is me but it is like two steps removed from the truth in some way first of all it's not it may not correspond to my innate tendencies, innate essence tendencies. And then also it is definitely not the real I, as we talk in the fourth way, this uh, that which is aware, the witnessing presence. Uh, and also another quality of this, one way to recognize false personality is a certain, um, they call it in the, in the fourth way, a certain hydrogen but we can say a certain frequency or certain emanation, uh, which is very different than the emanations or frequency or hydrogen of essence. So essence seems tends to be sim more simple, more straightforward, more uh, innocent, pure, simple, uncomplicated, lighter, happier. <laughs> um, and false personality is this 
this this this uh, frequency of he more heavy, uh, encumbered, complicated, tortured, um, more deception, more uh, appearances, and it's a uh, heavier. As we get more conscious, we actually sense this in people. We don't have to know this particular characteristic. It, there is we sense it. There is a tendency in um, awakening work to look at the ego or false personality or separate self to um, make it as an enemy and to uh, as the bad guy, the devil, actually in various spiritual traditions, that's the devil, um, and to fight it and to make it wrong and to judge it. Um, and... It's important to realize that this this ego, this false personality, is actually acts as a protective. Was developed the child, the teenager started to to develop these things in order to protect some kind of the vulnerability of essence, the sensitivity of the heart, the feeling the impact of certain harsh words or certain people who don't care. So it's really. Uh, it developed as a strategic adaptation to protect oneself and adapt to this world, which is, unless you are in a special jungle or in a tribe, this world is uh, aligned with false personality, the education, the school system, everything is false personality. And false personality is initially is formed as to protect us, then it becomes like as a way to um, stifle essence. So that which initially protects us, the mask, the armor, at some point kind of is glued to the face and we, we don't know what is inside anymore. There's nobody, the, the tender, the essence is almost innocence, spontaneity, creativity is pushed away uh, in a corner there. So... Yeah, it is important also any type of um, self-observation or investigation we do in the fourth way, as well as non-duality, we need to have this attitude of observing these tendencies, observing these stories, observing this energetic content without trying to get rid of it, without trying to judge it, without being upset with it and simply observing as a curious, interesting stranger, having this affectionate, loving, benevolent awareness of these things. Because if we fight it, if we we, if we are upset with it, from one angle, it's actually false personality fighting with itself, false personality judging itself. And this doesn't actually work because we, if we reject some aspect of ourselves and we, we are upset with some aspect of ourselves, then we set up some internal warfare that maintains that particular thing. So only more like in the thorough, loving, benevolent, curious investigation uh, with a full acceptance of that without judging it, that can be um, diminished, understood, and it, it releases Anything is prompted in you to continue with this? Yes, I was just trying to think how to start with it. That um, you know, it's what's interesting too is our concern isn't really with false personality. Um, this becomes a study, but the reason we study this is our concern is our inner being, the silence of being in us, from where presence and awareness emanates and where it is conscious as itself, at the core of ourselves, who we are. That's our real concern. And, and what is Mihai said, that this false personality develops in us, and then it stifles that. And the fourth way terminology, this part of us literally forgets about itself. It almost disavows itself because it's under pressure now to meet the expectations that the world starts to impose on it because those expectations correlate with a sense of identity. This is me now in relation to the world. And now I, my false personality, I as a false personality, start to develop expectations of myself. 
And this is where almost all human inner conflict comes from. Our sense of expectation relative to the world and other people and our sense of expectation relative to ourselves. This is a whole arena of psychological uh, uh, conflict is a, is a good word. And that's why we feel ill at ease often. We're not content and we're not happy with our life and we're not happy with our job or relationship or whatever it is. We have these because it, we have these expectations and they're not met. And then when we learn about false personality and set about trying to study it, what happens is we then start to have an expectation about getting rid of false personality. And that's why I say that's not really our concern. Our concern is what is at the source of our being? Who are we deep within ourselves where we're more quiet and um, true is, is a nice way to think of it. I was going to say also still, but it's what Peter Spensky called the quiet place within. And we all know this feeling and we all know that it's it's meaningful to to be to be from there to be from to manifest from there but often very quickly these layers get added of expectation we start to act in a certain way in the fourth way we do things like we start to just talk unnecessarily because we need we feel we need to project an identity to other people we lie we talk about things we don't know in order to appear as though we are somebody who knows something and this covers up this innocence of you know what of not knowing there's so much we really don't know about our creation, even about other human beings. We, when you really investigate it, there's so much we don't know. But that's not what happens with false personality. We adopt, I must know everything. I must gather all the information. I must form strong opinions. I must argue. I must resist. I must talk and lie and become identified, uh, in relation, with, especially in relation to other people. But even at home, if I'm getting dressed and I'm by myself, but I'm imagining how I'm going to look in relation to other people, how they're going to perceive me. Uh, and so then I, I'm caught up still in this image of myself. That's not this deeper sense of me. There's nothing wrong, of course, with dressing up and trying to look nice, but when it's all caught up in a sense of identity, that's false personality. And another a strong area, of course, in the fourth way where there's a lot of emphasis is the area of negative emotions. And in particular, the area of expressing, uh, especially in a very animated way, in an explosive way, negative emotions. Or, as Mihai knows, and as he works with a lot of his clients, suppression. That is also false personality. Uh, it's this base, this ego, this idea of myself. I must protect myself. I must push that down. I don't want to feel that. And so false personality can burrow its head in the sand as well as burst itself out onto the scene of the world. I am angry. I am upset. I am irritated. I am frustrated. I am having problems. And I want to let everybody know it because then it validates my sense of identity. And just to add to that, I'll say that Peter Spensky pointed out when we're born, as essence, we don't have this, um, there's not a factory inside us all ready to go to produce negative emotions. It's something we develop. We learn from other people how to respond to situations with negative emotions. And as he, as Uspensky pointed out, there's no real center in us for negative emotions. Even though the instinctive and emotional centers often combine to, to produce negative emotions, the, this false personality acts, as he said, as an artificial center in us that manufactures, indulges in, and expresses or and or suppresses negative emotions. And this becomes a big area, an important area in the fourth way system for the study of false personality. And it goes back to chief feature, which me I mentioned also. This core, it's like the core around which the apple of false personality develops and now it's encased in this false personality and it's um it comes to uh it's like the at the source of what we defend is our idea of ourselves and we then encase ourselves with negative emotions of different kinds in order to buffet ourselves against 
being um, uh, really exposed as an artificial identity. Hmm. Yeah, lots of information here. And uh, hmm. in case you watch this, uh, stumble upon this one is the first one. This term negative emotion is, is not, it's a, it's a fourth way term. So it doesn't mean that we cannot have sadness or frustration or grief or fear. That's not what is meant by negative emotion. Negative emotion in the fourth way is a whole uh, production, a whole cocktail uh, based on uh, various energies and uh, imaginary attitudes and a sense of righteousness. And so it's not just an emotion. And uh, you can refer to previous videos where we go in depth about these um, negative emotions and non-expression of negative emotion as a way to diminish, actually diminish this false personality energy and use this charged energy to, to investigate our uh, our wrong attitudes, what I mean, untruthful attitudes about ourselves or the world, and also use this intense charged pain body energy to to um, fuel this rather than in explosions or self beating, to fuel this towards more presence. Yeah, I want to, to link it here um, also from my clinical work or doing uh, psychosomatic inquiry and uh, various methodologies and psychotherapies and things like that. A lot of what I do um, for, let's say, uh, work, which I love, is people come to me as a somatic psychotherapist and they have some type of suffering of sorts and I always find that underneath a certain kind of this, under some kind of addiction or compulsion or or painful relational pattern or certain kind of self-sabotage or something like that, underneath some kind of, um, as I said, one of these patterns, there is a, a sense, some core negative message about oneself, what, what is called deficiency identity, deficiency story identity. Um, which was formed early on by a child's essence when they were like four or five or six in connection with how other people treated one or in connection to just simple events uh, that the child, for lack of understanding or, you know, uh, they developed this, oh, it must be, this happened, or the dad is like that, or mommy left or whatever is happening it's because of me because i'm not good enough or because i i'm not lovable or because it's my fault so you see there's some kind of innocence innocence of essence that develop these beliefs in heightened painful moments and that becomes the seed in some way of this deficiency identity which is the core of false personality uh, not good enough, I'm a failure, uh, I'm hopeless, I'm a fuck up, uh, there's something wrong with me, I cannot love, I won't amount to anything, it's, you know, uh, all of this, I'm just, there or are I'm wonderful. Yeah. I'm, I'm invulnerable, I'm superior, I am always right, I always know everything, I can do anything, mm -hmm. I can take charge, I'm the best, um, I'm, people admire me, so it's the other side and this yeah. is related to uh, a one way to observe false personality quickly and often is in the area of judgment mm. false personality essence does not judge essence just sort of beholds it just sees what's happening it looks and it sees what's happening but the judgment this evaluation process that goes on psychologically is a characteristic of false personality and it's quite subtle but we can all see that it's like a barometer. It's always going up and then down and then up. And then we, we evaluate something. We look at other people and we're either giving them credit 
for things. The, so the barometer goes up sort of in positive mode. And then we are criticizing, we're finding fault with them. We're accusing them. We're gossiping about them. We're Even if it's internal, we are condemning them, belittling them, putting them, demeaning them. And um, this, all of this is false personality. And uh, then we do the same thing, of course, with ourselves. We're almost always, you can see it throughout the day, I feel pretty good. I'm, you know, this is good. <laughs> Feeling pretty good. And then it's like, man, oh, God, why'd they say that? Oh, this isn't going to work. Or I'm, I, it, so the, it, just to say this barometer goes up and it goes down in all of us all the time in little and then in extreme ways too. But to look for judgment and to look for criticism of others, judgment and criticism of other people and of ourselves. And then of course, what happens, we extend it to situations, to my job. Some days I really like, yeah, this is a pretty, gosh, it's a pretty nice job. You know, I like this job. And then this is the worst. I, I got to get out of here. And this is the same barometer the same critical fact faculty you could call it in us and uh, many times we're taught to think this is this makes us smart this makes us perceptive this makes us we think we'd be having discrimination because we we're able to really evaluate the world and be critical and judgmental and assess it for better or for worse and it's almost always false personality that's doing this rarely do we look out at the world and at other people and ourselves and see ourselves objectively, meaning truthfully, as things really are. False personalities, twisting the picture, clouding the picture, misconstruing what it sees in order to validate a sense of self inside in a positive or a negative way. It's a big study in us. This is a big uh, blanket we have wrapped around us mm -hmm. psychologically and um to get to the core back at the deepest part of ourselves is not so easily done as as many people might like to think or hope mm -hmm. the illusion is tricky as the tibetan buddhist <laughs> saying goes yeah, I like what you said is that although clinically people come with a more deficient sense and deflated sense of identity, um, one can have inflated sense of identity, false personality. And uh, I, 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 I had like this as an inflated sense of false personality with like arrogance. I know better. I am better. Uh, and with this... Um, wanting to be recognized, wanting to be seen, wanting people to know. But at the same time, I notice in myself and other people, one can coexist. There can be here like, hey, I, I, I got this. I know, look at me. And at another layer uh, of the onion, it's like, oh, I, no, I don't have what it takes. I'm not good enough. So they can all coexist. And what often that happens, you know, you're out in the world mm -hmm. and you and the inflation happens and you're projecting, you're trying to convince other people. Mm -hmm. You're really trying to convince yourself, but you're doing it in the form of convincing other people that you are valid and strong and capable. And then you go home and close the door. Mm -hmm. And that's where it flips into its negative often. And people, they deflate very quickly and they go, oh, my gosh, it's really terrible. But then someone opens their front door and they, oh, hi. And they're back to this projection of everything's fine. I'm wonderful. You're wonderful. Um, you know, if you look at Facebook, everybody looks like everything's wonderful all the time. Uh -huh. And it's uh, it's almost like, I mean, it's not always true, of course, with everything, but something like Facebook. But it's, it could almost be called false book uh -huh. in many instances because it's a projection of an identity of me in relation to the world. And it's how I want to be perceived. And But at the deepest part of it's, it's how I imagine myself, and I want other people to agree and confirm and affirm that this is who I am, and it's not who we are really at our core, and that, which is our main, that's our main focus in the end here with all this work called the fourth way. Mm. It's to come back to the truest, most real, most genuine part of our our inner being so practically speaking as we are engaging in fourth way applied work we are encouraged to 
uh, learn very soon some ways to harness attention. So to, to develop this quality of observing, witnessing, uh, without analyzing or without being lost in the voices. So early on, we develop these skills of um, self-observation, being more present to the present, being less lost in the churning of the mind, and develop this ability to witness, to observe, to be less identified with the content. So that's more like turning on the, the light, turning on the light that we need in order to sort this house that is in disarray. Yeah. And then, so we are encouraged to now bring this light. And also this light needs to keep being developed because often we observe for like three minutes something and then we stop observing. We are judging what we observe and then we are lost in past and future about it. So this quality of witnessing, presence, self-remembering, self-observation, being less identified with the mind stream and feelings that needs to be ongoing um, work to jumpstart that, make it more vivid and strong. At the same time, you know, Socrates was saying, know thyself, yeah, know thyself. And then is this, this has two elements. There's the element of no, no me high, no, no, basically Mihai's false personality and it's his tendencies and patterns of trying to be in a certain way and trying not to be like this in order to get the recognition and approval and to control. So part of knowing oneself is to know one's false sense of self, one's false personality. And the other aspect of knowing oneself, which comes later, is as this false sense of self is loosening up, diminishing, it's less charged, less intense, there's less power in the company. Now there's more spaciousness. One's essence is quite in a quiet place within that has very clear preferences. So this starts to be more in charge. And the knowing oneself is also knowing that, as well as knowing the knower. That's more like advanced work, knowing, being aware of, of whatever this is, which is perceiving. Yeah. However, we can't go there initially. It's too abstract. It's not practical as long as false personality is so rampant and active. So the point of fourth way work is to, as you turn, have more light and you strengthen the light or a flashlight then we need to start observing our false personality and to become like a like a researcher a scientist where we know this thoroughly yeah i mentioned the attitude of observation like not judging not fighting it just very uh, benevolently neutral but right on we need to know our shit as they say, we need to know it because if we are not aware of our false personality, if we don't study it, we are it all the time. So part of the work is to be more awake, to find it out, know it. And it's not, we don't, you know, false personality is two or three things, three or four things we have. It's not like a rocket science. And we'll find those manifestations over and over again in us and other people. So we need to know them and struggle with them and maybe we can talk now a little bit what are some of these core manifestations of false personality and we talked before but it's important to be touched upon this false personality is like a whole show and it's like it's it can be seen it's obvious it's obvious to oneself like, oh God, I went this again, I justified myself and I defended myself and I just talked about myself all the time. So it's it's visible, all of this show. But underneath that, there is this uh, sense of me, like the sense of separate me out of which it, it emanates. So but we first start with knowing, the, investigating the show um, and 
diminishing it, starving it, quieting down to actually get to the very uh, Wizard of Oz, you were saying. Mm -hmm. We have to get to the actual Wizard of Oz. So I would like to go now into what are some of these core <laughs> loud things that we have no doubt. Whenever I'm engaging in this, I know that Mm -hmm. it, has a, it has yeah. a certain flavor right and and it's an art form really we can be going to specifics and you can turn it into a science really to study the manifestations of false personality but the art of it is uh recognizing its flavor and mm. each, and that's up to each of us because our false personality has a slightly different flavor mm. than somebody else's but and this is where the idea of judgment and being critical comes in. This is such a good area to watch it. And you said a minute ago, Mihai, we start to observe for a minute or two or three, and then we we um, judge what we observe in ourselves. And this is actually false personality reacting to our observations of false personality. Mm -hmm. So this is a good area to watch when, you know, to criticize. Another way to see it, uh, interestingly enough, is to notice what irritates us in other people. Mm. this is a beautiful study if you can do it from the right perspective because usually when we're irritated by another person it's indicative of something in ourselves and so you know we like to be with people who don't cause us any angst um, and usually because that makes our false personality comfortable those people and to be in situations where we're with people we don't they're like God, look at that you know that it's showing off but why does that person never say what they think or we're, we're critical and so we can use this this um it's like a measure it's like a measuring rod you can put it out into the world and detect things that you find irritating about other people and it can sort of send a signal back to you that's interesting why is that so affect me so much inevitably almost in every situation it's because we have something of the same or similar in ourselves this also brings up the point that it's not so easy to see below just the superficial layer of false personality in ourselves they're like layers we have layers of armor layers of psychological identity and 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 the whole thing has become a thick woven fabric of how we imagine ourselves and how we project ourselves but watching irritation, watching judgment, watching criticism, both criticism of others and self-criticism are very, um, they're visible ways of seeing this, this creature mm -hmm. called false personality. But one thing I want to say before you go back, hand it back to you, Mihai, is this connects to the idea of not being judgmental of false personality. You said Mm -hmm. It's important to benevolent, what did you say? Benevolent? Benevolent and neutral observation. Yes, to observe impartially and benevolently, to not be critical of ourselves and of other people, If you know, to slip past that limitation. And the reason is we want to be able to use this, um, this blanket of, 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 of our false personality. We want to be able to unwrap it and see the whole thing, and then see that we are not that. Mm. So we this is because it, the, the, this blanket is covering up this um, simple, true, very deep, actually, part of ourselves that is not visible. And the blanket, you see, is all visible. It's all about being visible. And so we want to take off this blanket. It would be like undressing completely, and then realizing who we are without all these psychological garments. And we need this process of unwrapping to come to that in a in a in a meaningful way. So false personality is not bad. And it can can become, as you said, a, a very we can become a, an investigator, a benevolent investigator of ourselves. This is true self-investigation investigation of our false sense of ourselves yeah i think in the fourth way one of the teachers would say learn to observe yourself or investigate yourself as if you are observing a curious interesting stranger <laughs> and also this attitude of like a true scientist a true scientist that 
observes like a, a new type of butterfly on a deserted island or a certain creature doesn't want to mess with it and interfere with it it's just just this observing it when it comes out of the when it comes out of the hiding and what does it eat and what does it think or well, this this uh, this inner tendency of some aspect of our false personality when it comes with what people what time of the day what does it say what is the attitude about oneself how does it try to be seen in a certain way or how does it try to not be seen that's the thing some false personalities want to be seen and some person wants not to be seen <laughs> you know so that's why you can't i mean we, we are going to give some clear flavors of it so we know but ultimately what peter said and also peter ospensky said it's like a certain kind of creature like a certain kind of dog and it has a certain smell has a certain kind of fur. So it will start to get to know it by taste, by flavor. And what will happen often too is the more you start to observe this in yourself, you will feel this flavor. You will feel this energy overtake you. You're with someone or you're with people and you're manifesting and you will feel it and you cannot stop it. Mm. And it becomes unpleasant, it becomes uncomfortable. And this is when we're starting to really see this image of ourselves. Because what's becoming uncomfortable is that very image. It's now being exposed. And it had covered it, you know, it was all these blanks. It didn't want to be seen. And so uh, it's not simply a matter of just, you know, observing our false personality. We have to live the experience mm -hmm. of seeing it and mm -hmm. having it be seen by us. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so it's like going it's like going through a gauntlet a psychological gauntlet of we have to go through this veil of who we imagine ourselves to be mm. to begin to discover what we really are uh, behind that and this yeah. is why we do these little exercises too with our group you know we we, we try weekly and monthly exercises and i'll a large majority of them are designed to help with this self-observation and expose these manifestations both internally and externally in us uh, relative to false personality in a neutral way, in a benevolent way, not in a, in a, um, we're not, you know, we jokingly said at the beginning, how are we going to kill false personality? But it is true. It's sort of like slaying a dragon or starving um, this part of ourselves. We do want to, take its oxygen away you know and the more you do that the more you see it kind of um complain and mm -hmm. and slither away and get uncomfortable and fight back and this is another thing that the fourth way reminds us of false personality fights back we are very attached to this imaginary idea of ourselves we're so accustomed to it and when we feel we're giving it up, we feel like we kind of don't have any, we don't exist. We don't, we no longer have anything. A small example, you know, there are some people who they always want to be on top of an argument or a discussion. They always want to end up on top with the last word or knowing everything or having the right opinion, proving other people wrong, things like this. For someone like that to simply resist offering their opinion <laughs> when there's a discussion or to wait five minutes or to wait 10 minutes can be excruciating, excruciatingly difficult for someone whose false personality is accustomed to always being the one who's right, always knowing everything, always being on top. The other extreme is someone who just sits quietly and never says anything, never says no when they feel like no. Come on, uh, Peter, you want to go? Let's, we're all going to go, blah, blah. And I don't want to go, but I don't, I just, I could say, no, no, thank you. I don't want to go. But what happens is false personality goes along and it's miserable. Um, so some people need to learn to be more vocal. That's a way for them to actually work against their false personality. These are just two examples out of many. Yeah, I mean, I have, I guess... Before I go into very precise examples, 
we talked here that yes, watch out for this. I observe some aspect of my false personality. Let's say wanting to get attention, going in a group and wanting to get attention and talking and and then I I become aware of it and I know what that is. And then it's like, oh man, you did it again. And also, this this quality of vanity, wanting to be recognized, wanting to be seen, wanting to be perfect in order to, you know, this quality of vanity is interested to work on itself to be more perfect and more wonderful. So sometimes false, some aspect of one's to no longer have a false personality. Yeah. Yes. To no longer appear to have a false personality. Yeah. Because it knows other people will judge it if it. Yeah. If it if it had yes. Yeah. So it can the be very illusion is tricky, pernicious. Now, this being said, there is a, some kind of pain that I notice with people that they start to see them, see their, see themselves. What I mean, see themselves, see their falseness. They're like, oh God, I mean, I have this, and these judgments, and like, and this, this beating myself up, and this pattern that. So yeah, there, there's something here. This is um, some conscience conscience is that seeing one's falseness seeing one's pain seeing the the pain i inflict on others and myself unwillingly and it it's heavy so um actually Gurdjieff was saying that uh, if you start to see yourself you are going to be horrified um of course it's that it's important not to let this now develop and take over, be identified with this, but there is some kind of pain of seeing the truth about one's false self. And that is a good ingredient, uh, which is part of the ingredients that will starve um, and motivate us to, to really be more awake and not go along with that, because now we know what it is. Uh, but clearly here, anything to do with judging other people, judging people. Uh, and there is a dis there is a distinction between judgment and discrimination. Yeah, so I have videos about that. I don't want to go into that. Some people are confused. They're saying, well, uh, I feel like that I can't trust this person. They are a crook, but oh, this is judgmental. You can't think like that. No, we have something in us that we sense that this person is a crook and you can't trust them. Because I said that also the more awake you are, the more you see, you see things. So it doesn't mean not to have discrimination. It doesn't mean not to have preferences, but judging, judging other people. It shouldn't be like that. It should be like this, judging oneself. Um, you know, all the four agreements, three agreements out of the four agreements of Don Miguel Ruiz, they are targeted towards false personality. Like be impeccable with your word. Don't take things personally and don't make assumptions. False personality is not impeccable with the word. False personality is going to lie, is going to judge others, is going to talk shit about others, is going to gossip about others, and is going to um, complain. This complaining. Um, complaining, criticizing, condemning. Yeah. Yes. Others or oneself. Or oneself. What Peter said before, it's also very Jungian, the shadow principle, like something that bothers me in other people. So be very interested in what bothers you about other people because there's a lot of information for self-investigation here. It's very likely I have this thing and I don't like it. I I have this thing and my false personality doesn't like that. So then it shadows it out to other people and I see it in other people a lot. And sometimes we don't even know that we don't like it in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's interesting is we don't like it in someone else. Mm -hmm. And this is what's so interesting. And we think it's about them. When we don't like it in them, it's actually because it's in us in some fashion. And so this study of other people serves as a, as a lens for looking back, shining that lens back at ourselves to see or to try to begin to see the source of that. Mm -hmm. Because we don't see it in ourselves initially that we are like that. This is how um, self-deceived we are about ourselves. We don't even see our weaknesses, our false, and I say weaknesses from the point of view of knowing who we really are. 
and our, how we deceive ourselves about who we really are and what we really are. But we get irritated by these things in other people. And it's uh, it takes a lot of honesty and a lot of courage and a lot of patience to and not even be able to know at first what it is, but just to carry it with you for an hour a day. Why did Joe, when Joe did that, why did it bother me so much? That's mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. And just to let it settle and mm -hmm. see what we can discover. And inevitably what will happen if you continue that is then when it pops up in you, you will almost see Joe. Mm -hmm. You will see yourself becoming Joe. And then you'll go, ah, oh, yes, there it is. That's it. This anything where this flavor of taking things personally, you know, somebody said something or did something, and I'm offended, I'm bothered, I'm triggered. Very be very interested in your triggers. Triggers are rich, uh, rich material. Usually we are triggered because there's some false personality sensitivity that is touched. Um, making assumptions about people, making stories about people. Um, this one thing to get, yeah, one of my teachers was saying that some of the core tentacles or prawns of the ego is wanting to get recognition wanting to get recognition and love and approval, um, wanting to be seen, uh, wanting to be deemed wonderful, wanting to control, wanting to control, even to control myself, control others, control situation, control reality, how things should be. Anything to do with this should. He shouldn't do this. They shouldn't be done. This shouldn't happen. <laughs> this is all false personality. And control can also take the form of resistance. Just always resisting. Because it is a form of controlling things for, for one's sense of identity. Some people are just really good at resisting everything. Mm -hmm. It's like you could almost say that someone's chief feature is always saying no first the first reaction is always no always some manner of form of resistance so it's not just yeah me being obsessive about controlling things and controlling mm -hmm. other people or being bossy or mm -hmm. being pushy i uh, can take what is often called passive aggressive mm -hmm. uh control there's also this um this trying to control in order to be safe Underneath this is that the world is not safe. I am not safe. I need to protect myself by by isolating myself, by avoiding going out, by avoiding relationship, by avoiding new things and being in this cocoon while being a super nice, generous, loving guy. You know, I know, I know this. So it's not doesn't need to be obnoxious, loud. It can be very sweet man and very uh, you know, but it's still is this element of yeah trying to protect myself and being in a small box so as we took a little break here we just realized that one core aspect of the false personality is that it creates conflict and issues within oneself and with other people, all of this conflict and problems at some individual scale and righteousness and issues with people, with family members, with the world, all of this, uh, this is any conflict, any issue, there is some aspect of false personality there that plays out also at the, at the level of nations and basically why this unusual species here the human beings they have all this killing each other when my, my grandfather used to say that the human is the only creature here that kill each other when they're not hungry gosh you know yeah so um this wow. is more like false personality uh spreading bleeding at the level of a global global scale and this is also connected to what the fourth way calls unnecessary suffering that the fourth way distinguishes that 
yes, we are human beings. Yes, we do suffer. We suffer pain. We suffer loss. Mihai mentioned earlier, there are emotions, heavy emotions. They can be dark emotions of anger, sadness, loss, uh, even sometimes a deep sense of loneliness, which often gets taken the wrong way. But there can be these feelings that are heavy. Let's call them, um, yes, heavy emotions. But what the fourth way is referred to as negative emotions is this idea of our, it's me, 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 I, 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 and all this conflict. And a lot of the unnecessary, what I was referring to a moment ago, could be considered real suffering. And there's a place for that in human life. There's a reason for that in human life. And that reason is also intimately tied up with connected to awakening. And we'll get into that in another video, perhaps. But for now, we can say that almost all of the rest of what we consider suffering is unnecessary. It's psychological. Our problems with other people, our conflicts, our feeling that we must meet expectations, our irritations, our judgments, all of this, it, uh, it, if when you investigate it, it's unnecessary. We can live our lives completely without that. Mm -hmm. And when you actually, when you take all of that away from yourself and from your psyche and from your life, life is very simple. And life is um, flows, you could say, naturally, instead of there always being a bump on the road or a pothole in the next step and something to be afraid of and something to worry about, something to feel anxious about. All of that unnecessary suffering is due to what, what the fourth way calls false personality. And this is the knot we're trying to untie, unravel um, in ourselves to come to the reality of just being a human being on planet Earth without all of this artificial uh, shroud, both in ourselves and in the way we look at the world. It's so interesting to think that the conflict around the earth between nations, as you were saying, between cultures, between religions, between political parties, you name it, all of it is artificial, and yet all of it is part of the design of human creation on earth. This, is, this in itself is very interesting, but from the individual point of view, it's unnecessary. We don't need it. We can live without it. And then that's where our possibilities of self-transformation, awakening, enlightenment, what the fourth way calls evolution, all starts to come into play. We can be free of all of these, what the fourth way also calls laws. And false personality is really a series of laws, you could think of it, that we are under in ourselves. And we can escape from these laws, this law of false personality, and we'll be much lighter and more content without it and actually able to function better mm -hmm. yeah just to make sure because we that's a big area of false personality i want to be mentioned i want to mention in this area of what's called inner considering and we have video uh about this but all of this to do with uh what they think of me and trying to avoid being judged and trying to be seen in a good light and trying to to um be appreciated and trying to and all the dance we are doing in order to get that or to avoid this you know this is definitely false personality uh trying to hide trying to pretend trying to appear in a different way and the idea is that we are talking about this topic uh from the point of view of awakening you know, awakening and reaching high levels of being, uh, realizing that the true identity is a presence, and also going beyond that into realizing that other, let's say, cosmic truths and the truth of reality. But in order to go there, one cannot go from being in false personality basically there's a false personality and then false personality going towards enlightenment or liberation it doesn't work like that so so this false personality identity needs to diminish a lot needs to become disabled somehow to to not be operational and then uh, because this spends a lot of energy here actually this 
first of all, it has a lot of thoughts. When one is in false personality, it's a lot of thoughts, it's a lot of reactivity, a lot of problems, a lot of imaginary problems, a lot of uh, past and future. It's uh, complex, complicated, and it's unhappy, actually, really. So one needs, this needs to die. And I'm I'm saying this not that we have to kill it or destroy it, but this needs to die. The good news is that this is not real. <laughs> it's not real. It's a fabrication. And actually, one is will be much happier, much happier. And one will live, as Peter said, more flow, spontaneous, easier, less conflicts. Um, so in the Gurdjieff, Gurdjieff talks about that in the Gospels too, that from one angle, one can see the fourth way work or esoteric Christianity, which we are going to do another video later about it. On these three phases to the process is to, to wake up, to become more conscious, to awaken, to become more conscious, to die and to be born, to be reborn, to awaken, to die and to be reborn. So one needs to be a little bit more conscious, more aware to investigate all this false personality, ego, lies, habits, deceit, pretenses, all this useless, painful stuff. Those needs to die in order for something else to be born. And that something else to be born is essence becoming aware of itself. Yeah. Um and one, you know, usually there's this mistake of awakening. Awakening is the final product. But the way we look at it in the fourth way, one needs to be more conscious to realize the, the terrible things that are happening uh, in our basement and shining, and those need to die. Now, how does it die? Or we can maybe uh, go in this direction. Uh, what is the work with false personality? What is the... How, how does it die? How does it diminish? What are the necessary ingredients for a skillful work towards diminishing false personality? Well, this is where we also start to get into what the fourth way calls the obstacles to awakening, because all of these obstacles mm. are essentially manifestations of false personality in us. And those are We've mentioned them before, but very quickly, imagination, especially this daydreaming churning of thoughts where we're lost in thought, and it's usually revolving around our something to do with us. Mm -hmm. So imagination, identification, meaning we're always getting lost in our activities, in our emotions, our thoughts, other people. We we lose a sense of this inner sense of being. It's the first thing to go when we're identified. Out it goes. And and our this awareness coming from us, this consciousness emanating from us, goes out, attaches to things, and ends up forming as an identity in relation to our own thoughts, our own emotions, our own lives. So imagination and identification, what's called inner considering, as Mihai mentioned, where we're constantly measuring and worrying about what other people think of us, how we think we should measure up to their requirements or they should measure it up and meet our requirements um, and then this uh, idea of unnecessary talk where we talk when we don't need to talk we're talking just to fill space to kind of appear to be somebody and when we lie when we actually talk about things as if we knew what we were talking about but it goes even farther than that further than that to lying about who we imagine ourselves to be we lie to ourselves about who we imagine ourselves to be. And then the culmination of all of these is this overindulgence and manufacturing of what the fourth way calls negative emotions, where we turn our view of the world into a negation, a rejection of what's really happening and of what we really are. And we cover all of that up and we do it in this form of negative, what the system calls negative emotions, which comes from negare, to negate. They are emotions that negate reality. Uh, so each of these is uh, something we will go into. We've gone into each of these in some other videos that are 
both. We would recommend you watch if you're interested in this. Uh, and But it's, again, we could do many videos on each of those topics I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. But it begins often by suggesting, try to notice when you're in imagination and try to, to come back to focusing on where you are. The same if you find yourself identified, you feel this electricity in yourself of becoming lost in things, try to back up, slow down, come back to a sense of presence and not being so caught up in things. And then if you find yourself in considering, uh, it's suggested to, first of all, just to try to notice it. And in fact, that's true of all of these things, because in the end, this false personality, we don't kill it. And the reason we don't kill it, there's actually nothing to kill. It's a psychological entity. That's all it is. Like in the ether of our psychology, there's this sense of identity. And by virtue of it being seen long enough, and by having enough light uh, thrown onto it, it it is that's why it's called an illusion, the illusion. It's like a hologram in us. And by virtue of being seen, it starts to dissipate, dissolve, neutralize. It collapses onto itself because we're not giving it. We're not breathing life into it by being identified with, with ourselves in this way. So we we the fourth way recommends methods which are really, they appear to be methods of quote unquote, working against our false personality. They're really methods of exposing false, rendering it visible in ourselves. And the more it's rendered visible, the more it will, it will by necessity weaken because it operates successfully because it does so in the dark, meaning with, without the light of consciousness on it. Yeah. It's also a little bit with this, uh, hmm vampire um mythology that they they don't the vampires they don't like the light and if you can catch them in the light they are kind of shriveling away and like dissolving disappearing getting burned away now this is a little dramatic what i just said but it's more like a like a repeated persistent exposure of this imaginary um show to the light of witnessing so that's one necessary a, a persistent repeated exposure now also in my clinical work um some core of false personality is this deficiency identity and you were asking me yesterday well how do you work with people that maybe are not even interested in the fourth way or awakening how what's the protocol here what 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 needs to happen and so, what would you hope to achieve yeah. What, would, what are they hoping to achieve? Yes. So basically, whether people are, in, and now I'm addressed more to people that are interested in awakening uh, fourth way, but all of us, we have this sense of deficiency identity, which is a set of beliefs about me and has certain feelings and certain resistance to feelings about these beliefs. And then there's a, some kind of set of pattern of how to show up in the world in order to compensate for this belief and this deficiency identity usually has a corollary of self-sabotage and wanting to manifest this to manifest relationship and situations uh, to confirm that i am unlovable or that i can't trust anybody you know so my work is to uh have the people and these are subconscious that's the tree that's the tricky part because people can tell me all kind of stories uh and all kind of people they have problems these people they've done this and this is on the conscious mind but on the subconscious mind there this deficiency story and all of the cocktail uh so what i want is to slowly have them become aware of what is their one or two or three deficiency identities and i have them really look at it without squirming away from it, without embroidering it, without trying to get rid of it, just to look at it square in the face. It says, yeah, man, something wrong with me. Okay, can we just look at this thought? This is a thought, man. It's a thought. You are aware of this thought. So I'm investing it at the thought level, looking at it. I'm uh, bringing awareness to the feelings and all of the, the stuff. Also, connected to these thoughts i'm bringing awareness to actually 
different aspects of one's life when it was developed and helping the person realize that it was a misunderstanding. This, uh, this, this is not true. Through some gradual investigation, as well as of this, this payoff. There's a payoff and subconscious utility to maintain this false personality identity. So it's important to make conscious those. There are some payoffs which actually don't work and they create suffering. So I'm bringing to awareness all of these components repeatedly. And the end result is that the person or that person's consciousness will realize that this story is not true. These feelings are connected to the story, which is not true. And also it is safe to allow these feelings because it's not going to kill me. And after they are felt a few times and the story is seen a few times, this kind of diminishes. So seeing that it's not true and even more profoundly to see that I am not this. Yeah, that this is some apparition. It's a hologram that appears to this presence. And I am this presence, actually. I am this which is aware. And this which is aware is not unlovable. <laughs> it's not not good enough. Yeah, so that is uh, some kind of type of work I do rather than convincing them or encouraging them or, you know, just having them really see it thoroughly and then it diminishes actually and one is more in essence and it seems like it's more simple life is better and less conflict and it is totally possible i mean i've seen with people and i've seen it i've seen it often this is like a big monster and tortured kind of thing and then it can be like gradually it is like out it's not there anymore life is much better and now <laughs> we're in our place to really uh, do what Ramana would say, to look into the nature of that which is aware, to do this deep investigation of reality and of the true self. Because we don't have all this static and all of these rats in the basement now, you know, and this torture, there's more quietness of mind, there is more clarity. So now we can really go some deeper level, we can go deeper and deeper and allow this sense of consciousness, wisdom to expand. And I think um, just to just to conclude our video for today, uh, because we've, we've, we have put forth a lot of information here hmm. and to consolidate all that takes time to digest it, consolidate it integrated into the, uh, the whole of what this work is takes time but i wanted to say in con partly in conclusion before you might have anything else to add mihai is that we each of us knows each of us can find in ourselves deep in ourselves this inner compass it may be deeply tucked away in a, some pocket in our being but we have it we have this compass and we know yes i want to i want to go come back to being what i really am and we, um, this isn't this thing about false personality is not a terrible thing it doesn't make us a bad person it's simply not a representation of who we and what we really are. And we can find this compass and follow it, have it lead us back to who we are. And that's really what the fourth way is designed for too. Like all the great teachings, really it's to enable us to rediscover this compass in ourselves and then trust this compass to being who we really are. And it's people who watch this kind of video uh, who who know what I'm talking about, who feel this, yes, yes, I want to reach again into that pocket and find that compass and return to being who I really am. And that's what, in the end, that's where this will lead us, all this work in relation to false person. That's where it's designed to lead us. 
yeah we will um, do another video uh, on getting more nitty-gritty uh, on studying and getting more precise about identifying our particular uh, qualities of false personality and and tackling this idea that is uh, very important in the fourth way, the chief feature. We need to study our chief feature and resist it. And because if as long as this chief feature is active, then false personality is still very active and we are asleep. So we're going to have another video on that. If you are new to this and you are interested in not just thinking about this and reading books and to have a a practical container to actually study and apply this um, work. So reach reach out to us and see information below. And uh, yeah, may this uh, help with your inner compass to navigate this uh, treacherous, uh, treacherous waters of, of painful illusions and get to the shores of more simplicity and the quiet place within and as well as the the peace that passes and passes understanding <laughs> so thank you everyone ciao ciao thank you